Well, good morning. Just about that time to get started. Want to welcome everybody here. Glad you made the choice to be here to worship this morning. Got just a few announcements, and uh, we'll get started with our worship service. If you haven't uh, grabbed a bulletin, they're right out here in the foyer. Walk out the doors there on the right-hand side. They're on a the little table. Our guests, thank you so much for being here. You are our honored guests. Give us a chance to be able to meet with you and talk with you before uh, before we all head uh, to our to our homes after worship. Met with Fawn, you'll see in the announcements that her brother uh, got some really good news, answered prayers on his behalf. Uh, some really good results came back, so he's been battling uh, some cancer, getting treatments and all that stuff. There's still just a little bit, a little remnants there, but the doctors are very happy with the results, and so is family, and uh, they've got uh, happy days ahead. So answered prayers there. Uh, summer sing. So normally we have our uh, singing emphasis uh, sometimes, well, it's usually about the, uh, the middle of the month. It'll be after a Sunday worship service. We'll do a singing emphasis. We're going to include that with our summer sing this month, and that'll be the, the 28th. So those two events will be combined for this month. Next month, we'll get back on track with having sing, singing emphasis after Sunday worship. We've got the Happy Hollow Sing tonight. Um, it's coming up in, in, on the 20th, I'm sorry. Uh, the youth night or the, the teens where they gather uh, Sundays we're watching the, the Bible, the movie The Bible, and going through each of those chapters and discussing it and just having some good times playing games and, uh, and praying and having, sharing meal. That is canceled tonight. That was going to be at the Daniels house. But we've got kids scattered abroad and they're not going to be able to be in attendance so we'll, we'll uh, cancel that tonight until further notice, maybe next, next Sunday. There is, a, I was told that there's a Hollister Church of Christ. There is a singing night coming up. I'm going to try to get that announced. I don't have, I think it's the 30th. Not sure exactly what time it is, but I'll get the details on that. And uh, maybe Wednesday or something, we'll have announcements and have the details on that. But again, Hollister Church of Christ on the 30th is having a singing night. Uh, learned that little Scott, um, he's, got, uh, he's at home right now with strep, strep throat. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, so uh, keep that little guy in your prayers for a quick healing. Uh, Joe, I think, met with Kathy and Vic Sicard sometime here recently, and uh, they seem to be doing really well. So answered prayers there. And then I met with uh, Alicia and Jeff on behalf of Alicia's uh, dad. Uh, you see in the, uh, on the prayer list and that she's also posted in the, the Facebook page, you know, he's been dealing with uh, some really severe uh, sinus. Uh, I, and they're not even sure if it's really sinus. Uh, it's just signs of or, or remnants. Um, of a type of sinus uh, allergy, extreme allergy symptoms. But anyways, I mean, it's causing like loss of sleep. He can't work uh, near the hours that he's, he's used to. They've scheduled him to do like day runs and not overnight runs. He's a truck driver. But anyways, he's in a real bad way. And so she's asking us to please continue prayers. He does have an appointment tomorrow. Um, and so hopefully uh, we can get get to a point where he can be treated for whatever it is that is that is affecting him in such a bad way. Outside of that, I really don't have too much more to say, but again, thank you all for being here. It's a great crowd. Joey? Amazing grace, how
unto the Lord, the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. First Chronicles 16, verse 29. My only hope is you. Most holy and righteous Father, we are so very blessed and thankful, Father, that we can bow before you, recognizing you as the one true and living God. Recognizing, Father, that it's such a great blessing for you to call us and consider us your children. Father, for the blessings that you bestow upon us and the love and mercy that you've shown toward us. We're mindful of that, Father, as we gather here for the purpose of worshiping you. Father, that we might be able to raise up that worship as you've instructed, but with the spirit, Father, that would bring you joy, would be an honor and a glory to your name in all that we do. We're thankful for the scripture, the word that's given for us to know your will for us, to understand, Father, everything except those things that, that uh, you consider mysteries that that uh, we must not dwell upon uh, or be hindered by but that we know that all that we need is you and we're thankful for that father we are mindful that for us to be a healthy church a healthy body of our lord here in this community that that we must each give ourselves first give our lives Father, we're thankful for the talents that are here and represented in, in our many teachers, in our deacons, Father, and their dedication to the service of this church and, and this body. Father, for the way that you've blessed us that we might be able to shine your light in this community and be uh, uh, cause others in this lost world to, to consider and, and inquire about the hope and the peace that we have. And, and why we have it. We know, Father, that we fail often, that we fall short, and, and Father, we ask your forgiveness for those things and, and help us that we will correct those, that we might uh, as well be more effective in, in, the, in the teaching and in the, in the sharing of the gospel. Father, we know that, that our physical ailments at times in this body and in this life uh, detract and 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 take our minds away from uh, the hope and the, and the commitment that we have. And, and Father, help us that we not take our eyes off of the goal of, of you and, and, uh, and the way to you through Jesus our Lord. Father, help us to be of service to one another as we these physical things get in the way. When we become spiritually sick and some of our number that... that uh, have uh, lost their way or have fallen away, we ask that you uh, 
give us the strength, the commitment, the dedication to, to seeking those that have wandered back to your fold. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful, that, Father, that, that through his teachings, his example, that we can raise up uh, children and young people that are equally committed to your service and to your uh, and and to seeking you, Father. As we continue through this worship, we ask that you help each of us individually stay focused upon what we're here to do, that it might be truly uh, raised up as a sweet-smelling sacrificial savor to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh. 
Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. I'm reading from the New King James Version. That is Exodus 21, 5 and 6. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Good morning. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful that you're here. And uh, I've been asked to fill in this morning. Derek's on vacation, maybe staycation. I think they're still around here. But um, we invite you back to to hear Derek and his talent and how he presents the word. It was the the spring of my my freshman year of high school in which uh, an area-wide youth retreat was taking place at Pickett State Park in Jamestown, Tennessee. And Jamestown, Tennessee is around the Tennessee-Kentucky border. And I remember that weekend for a couple of reasons. That weekend specifically was the very first time that I gave my very first Devo. That's also the very first time that I ever heard the song pierce my ear. And it really touched me. And then we sang it, we sang it on a Friday night, and then we sang it on Sunday as well. And I felt like I had never felt before. I guess that song had never moved me like that before. Well, the weekend goes on, and and then I graduate high school, and I attend Freed Hardeman. And then I hear that song more regularly at Freed. And it just always had a soft spot in my heart. I loved Pierce, my ear. And as I was going throughout my collegiate years, I sat in a Bible class, and the topic of that Bible class that day was on why, as Christians, we pierce our ear, and what that really means. Now, if I'm being honest with you, the the Bible class was early in the morning, and I probably really wasn't paying that much attention in college. However, I did grab bits and pieces of that Bible class. And last fall, we, we were singing this song here. It was led in a worship service here. And I thought, you know what? Like, I, I, I understand the concept of what it means and, and a lot of the history behind it of, of why we pierce our ear, but I'm going to engage in a Bible study to understand more clearly what it means when we pierce our ear and the commitment that it means for us as God's children. You see, everyone that obeys the gospel has pierced their ear by God. To begin, let us remove from our minds the idea and the image typically associated with slavery. When we think about modern day slavery, and I say modern day within the last couple of hundred years, when we think about slavery, we have a, a poor connotation of what that means. We, we think about the Underground Railroad. We, we think about someone who has been bound, chained, someone that, who has been purchased and bought monetarily to become someone's slave until either they pass away or maybe they had an owner that was gracious enough to set them free. But see, we're not going to be talking about that typical association of slavery that we understand. However, Jewish slavery was not like that, or at least it was not meant to be like that. Yes, there is the idea of being owned by another, but not as material means at the cost of humanity. In fact, a Hebrew could only be a slave to another Hebrew if he had offered himself as such in the first place. Make your way to Leviticus chapter 25 this morning. Let's let's dive in for the 
the short time that we have, let's dive in to a little bit of the study. We're only going to touch the hem of the garment this morning, but I wanted to give us an idea of what it means to pierce our ear this morning. Leviticus chapter 25, make your way down to 39 through 41. The ESV reads, If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve, he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children, with you, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. Why would anyone do such? Because they were more like servants than slaves. You see that they would receive a wage even though it would be half the wage of a hired hand. But if someone was desperate enough, then who would you want to serve and be a slave to more than your family? Deuteronomy chapter 15 shares a, a very similar context here. Deuteronomy 15 and verse 18. It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free from you, for at half the cost of a hired worker he has served you six years. So the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. You see that they were treated with kindness and in the fear of the Lord. Back in Leviticus chapter 25 Verse 43, you shall not rule over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. See, the truth is, this was a very kind and benevolent way of helping the poor and those in debt to one another. This leads us to the scriptures wherein a slave could choose to stay with his master forever. I appreciate Justin reading Exodus chapter 21 this morning. But I want to give us a little bit of context of what's going on before we read 1 through 6 of 21. The Israelites have been traveling away from Egypt now for some 53 days. And by the time that they had got to Mount Sinai, leading up to this point, they had been chased by the Egyptians. They had walked across the Red Sea on dry ground and witnessed the destruction of the Egyptian army. They had been fed manna from God. They had been given water out of a rock that was struck by Moses. They had been able to defeat the Amalekites without any true warriors. They had been taken to the mountain of Sinai and witnessed the fire, smoke, thunder, and quaking of the mountain because of God's presence that was there. They had witnessed Moses going up to the mountain to talk to God. This is where where we are within the book of Exodus. And Moses is getting two tablets of the law written by the finger of God. The law on Hebrew slavery for Jews concerning the Sabbath year. So follow along as we go to Exodus chapter 21. Let's read 1 through 6 together. These are the regulations that you must present to Israel. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he must serve no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. If he was single, when he became your slave, he shall leave single. But if he was married before he became a slave, then his wife must be freed with him. If the master gave him a wife while he was a slave, and they had sons or daughters, then only the man will be free in the seventh year. But his wife and children still belong to his master. But if the slave may declare, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I don't want to go free. If he does this, his master must present him before God. Then his master must take him to the door or doorposts and publicly pierce his ear with an awl. After that, the slave will serve his master for life. I'm a pretty visual person, I'm a visual learner. And I want that to sink in for just a second of what that means. An individual says, I don't want to go. And why would an individual not want to go 
when they've been a slave for someone for six years. You see, that master must have been pretty good to that slave. And for a slave not to want to go out and be free means that he's committed to his master. And so a public display of this, he takes him to the doorpost, gets him on the doorpost, he places his ear upon that doorpost, and he pierces the ear with an awl as a public display that you will serve me forever, for as long as you're here on this earth. This was very common. And it's not by accident with the parallelism that takes place in the New Testament that we too, we pierce our ears. Because we want to be God's forever. We want him to be our master forever. We want to serve our master forever. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 16 and 17. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take it all and put it through his ear into the door and he shall be your slave forever. And to your female slave, you shall do the same. Everyone's ear has been pierced, whether we know it or not. In this life, we are either slaves of Satan and sin, or we are slaves of God and righteousness. Paul talks about this in Romans, the sixth chapter. Make your way over to Romans chapter six, if you will. We'll read verse 16, but Paul is drawing this same concept and he wants us to understand what it means when we are a slave to God and then what it means if we're a slave to sin. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Matthew has the same concept in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This truth means every child of God pierces their ear on God's doorpost. When we obey the gospel, we wholly give our lives over to God as a slave. Going back to Romans chapter 6 and verse 20 through 22, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the, from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to satisfaction and its end is eternal life. Once again, this isn't slavery that we typically think of. You see, we are allowed the choice to leave whenever we want. God gives us that free will to leave whenever we want. But see, when someone truly pierces their ear, it means that they're here to stay. I'm not going anywhere I'm in it to win it if you will I'm going to give my all I am your servant God and I'm here to give you all that I have Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When we put our ear on God's doorpost, we must do so for two reasons. 
Hopefully the first reason is because we choose to be slaves of God, which because of the great love he has shown for us, You see, Jesus gave up so much to redeem us and be our Lord and Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 23, You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. The second reason is because God has offered each of his willing slaves an inheritance far greater than any other offer. For those that stay faithful and dedicated to their Lord and Master, and God there awaits for them a victorious crown. I think sometimes it's hard for us because we are so touch, feel, fall in love type of people. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the concept of not getting something now, but getting that victorious crown later. But God has promised that upon our faithfulness. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. A habitation with God. John chapter 14 and verse 2. In my house, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If there were not so, would I have told you that I have gone to prepare a place for you? See, as we consider that moment in time in which we made the commitment to follow our God in obedience to his will, let us remember the doorframe of righteousness that we place our ear upon and dedicate our lives to our God. Pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door this day. I will serve no other gods. Lord, I'm here to stay. When we, when we sing those words, we are singing a commitment that we are making to our God. Take me to your door this day. I will serve no other gods. By no other gods, we're not serving the world. We're not serving money. We're not serving the material possessions that we have. We're serving God. And God is the only thing that matters. And we make the commitment to say, Lord, I'm here to stay. My prayer and hope is that each of us are willing to wave the white flag and surrender all to God, making him the highest priority in our life. Waving that white flag, surrendering means putting God above all. And the word all encompasses everything, not some things, not the things that we enjoy, everything. Not the things that are are right or wrong, but everything, all encompasses everything. You know, this is, this concept has been around for, for centuries And if you think about it, farmers have done this very thing to identify a piece of cattle that they have, whether it be putting a tag in their ear or putting a brand on the hindquarter. We do the same thing with our pets. We we put collars on our pets to say who they belong to and a number to say, if you find this dog, call this number. We'll come get our mutt. You see, this is no different. You see, when we pierce our ear, we are identifying ourselves as Christ followers. When we pierce our ear, we are identifying ourselves as men and women of commitment and honor and righteousness God's plan is perfect. God knew that we need a redeemer. So he came in flesh. Served just as you and I are in this human form. To be 
spotless, without blemish, to be perfect as the perfect sacrificial lamb. And we do that so we can have eternal life, have the hope of eternal life with Him. And there are many different seasons and stages of life represented within this room this morning. There's, there's wisdom within this room. There's a lack of wisdom within this room, depending on what age group that you fall into. And then there's some folks that are in the middle. And whatever stage and season of life in which you are in, you may have been a, a baptized believer, but did you pierce your ear when you became a baptized believer? Well, sure, you, you got dunked in water, right? That means you're good. But see, when we pierce our ear, we're showing the commitment of living and serving our God. May our steps be worshipped. May our thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. And, and everything that we do we exhibit Jesus. The commitment that we have determines our faithfulness to God or lack thereof. But when one truly pierces their ear, they're here to stay. Have you pierced your ear? Have you done so in a manner knowing that you're called to a higher calling, knowing that your commitment to our God is forever and that you don't want to be and serve, you don't want to be anyone else and you don't want to serve anyone else or anything else because you've been bought with a price, the price of our Savior's blood. And all you do is have to commit yourselves to serving Him so you can have that victorious crown when that day comes. I did everyone a solid this morning and kept it way shorter than Derek ever has. But I wanted to share this study with you that I reminded myself of last fall. And I'm grateful that I've had that opportunity to, to do so. I hope that you've gotten something out of it. This morning, if you're here and, and, and you've realized that you thought you made that commitment to God, but, but it's not really been the commitment that you desired for it to be, then we're going to offer an invitation for you to make your life right with God. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never made your life right with God. You've, you've never put on your Lord and Savior in baptism. You've never gone to God's doorpost and pierced your ear in commitment to Him to want to be a servant for Him. Today's the day. Today's the day. Don't walk out of here because we know we're not promised tomorrow, but today's the day for that. Today's the day to make the commitment to serve God for the rest of our lives together as one. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Will you come as we stand and sing our invitation song?
I think we all struggle from time to time in different periods of our life. And not every struggle is the same for everyone. And I'm humbled to bring before you this morning our brother John Marchand, who, uh, who states that he said, I, I, uh, I have struggled lately with this very concept. He said, and, and life has gotten in the way, whether, whether it be work, um, he says, and, and having the commitment with work and other things, and he says it. It bleeds into a lack of time for his relationship with God. And, and he says, and he sees that, that trickle effect of when he doesn't have that opportunity to spend time with God or take that opportunity to spend time with God. He sees that trickle effect in everything, spending time with family, his kids, his grandkids. And he wanted to express to his church family this morning that he wants to be and desires to be and is committed to being more dedicated to his relationship with Christ. And if, if you've ever walked the aisle, I call it walking the plank. I've called that for years, walking the plank, because it's, it's lonely. And it is, it's nerve-wracking. It's humbling. It's one of the hardest things that we do as Christians to admit fault within our life and that we need help. And, and from a man perspective, we don't ever really want to ask for help. And so I admire you and I love you. And if you will, I don't know that I'm qualified to do this, but we're going to go to God in prayer and, and uh, we're going to pray for our brother and, and his strength and that, um, that he can deal with the things that he has expressed he needs dealt with. Let's pray. Father God, I am so humbled to come before you. And we approach you now, Father, for our brother, John, who has expressed to be better, expressed to have a, a more committed relationship with you who desires and longs for you and wants to be right with you. And God, it is, it is my desire that you, you give him the encouragement that you put your loving arms around him and that you will help to lead him every step of the way. That you strengthen his soul and his commitment for you. That, Father, that you will help him to prioritize the time that he so desires, Father, to spend in his relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that his friends, his colleagues, his family will see Jesus in his daily walk. Father, sometimes this world and the, the worries of it can weigh us down. But Father, our desire is our home in heaven with you. And Father, for that very reason, we say, please send your son quickly. There's nothing more important on this earth. There's nothing more important than us spending the rest of of eternity worshiping praising and bowing before you it truly is our greatest desire father I pray that that John as the leader of his home that he will always look to you for strength and guidance and that he find his happiness and joy within you. God, that is the, our desire for all of us as Christians, is that, that we be joyful. And that we, 
we find our happy place within you. Nothing of this earth, of a material set or fashion of any sort, Father, because we know that our only hope is within you and our Savior, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who scorned his Supper. And at this time, let's all clear our minds of the worldly thoughts and think back to that scene of the cross. And we'll have prayer for bread, please. Almighty God, we're honored to be in your presence. We're thankful that we can gather here today. We can gather here as brothers and sisters and children of yours. We're thankful for Jesus and all that he lived before us and all that was uh, given to us to study about him. We know that he lived in a body just as we have. He was tempted just as we are, and he was beaten and broken. And we, we take this bread now to remember that and to lift him up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. pray. Father God above, we're so uh, thankful.
thankful, Father, to be in your presence this morning. As we bow before your throne, Father, we come with thanksgiving for this fruit of the vine. Father, we're so grateful for what it represents. Father, we're so grateful that you was willing to give your only son and that he was willing to submit to you and to, to do such a selfless act and to spill his blood on that cross of Calvary for us. Father, we're so grateful and mindful of the cleansing power of that blood and, and realize that we couldn't know you without it. But Father, we are also equally equally grateful, Father, for the, for the love that's represented in that blood, that, that such an act would be done for each of us we're yet sinners. Father, it's our prayer that not only at this moment, but that we would always be mindful of, of that, that sacrifice, that love, and the power that's represented in it, and that we carry that with us uh, each day that you would allow us to awake and breathe the breath of life. It's in your son's name we pray. Was anybody overlooked? If not, that concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's also <laughs> commanded that we give. So let's have a prayer for the giving, please. Dearly Father, we come before you again, thanking you for our many blessings you've given to us. Be with each one of us that we may take what we have heard today and study it and apply it to our lives. Be with each one of us now as we give, that we might do so with a loving and cheerful heart. Christ's name, amen. Good mind, let's be standing for our final two songs and then we'll be led in our closing prayer. Oh, I still have joy. I still have joy.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, come this morning and worship you. Um, Father, we, we thank you for all of our visitors here, and uh, we want to pray for um, Ken Corice and uh, his answered prayers as his results came back. Um, great, Father, we, we thank you for that. Uh, Father, we, we want to pray for uh, Craig Bray as he is uh, uh, battling cancer. And Father, if it be your will, just um, help, him, help him battle through it and, uh, and, and, and help him be a cancer survivor, Father. And uh, Father, we pray for uh, John Huckby as he is, uh, as he is battling cancer, Father. Um, and, and that is great. Uh, we, we would like to pray for anybody else um, that be, might be sick or ill or on our minds. And uh, we, would, we would like to pray for our summer sing as it will be uh, hopefully a good turnout and, and that we can sing uh, praises to you. And uh, we pray all this through your son's name. Amen.